I'd like to introduce Dr. Bessie Young. Dr. Bessie Young and I go way back. We train together. She's way younger than I am, though. Um, Bessie took an interesting career path. Not only did she go to medical school at the University of Washington, and she did her internship and residency there. She did a fellowship in nephrology, so she's a nephrologist, but she also got a master's in public health. So she's an assistant professor uh, currently in the general internal medicine department through the University of Washington, and she's involved in the Seattle Epidemiologic Research and Information Center, the ERIC Center, out at the VA. She's uh, doing research, which is very interesting to all of us, um, and she's uh, investigating racial and ethnic differences in kidney disease presentation and progression, and uh, specifically diabetic nephropathy, what we've been talking about today. Um, not only the epidemiology of it, but the progression and uh, the management of diabetic nephropathy. Dr. Bessie Young. I'm going to talk today about treatment options for kidney failure. You heard a lot about kidney disease and kidney failure. Um, and I also am the director for the home hemodialysis um, program at the Northwest Kidney Center. So I do a lot with the dialysis program here in Washington State and King County. So I'm going to talk about treatment options for kidney failure and what to expect if that were to happen. So I'll give you a little outline of my talk and talk about what is kidney failure. I'm going to give you a little bit of history of dialysis and I will talk about the symptoms and the signs of kidney failure and then I'll talk a little bit about the treatment for kidney disease or kidney failure such as dialysis and transplantation. Transplantation and then we're going to actually have a patient panel with two of our patients um, from the Northwest Kidney Centers who uh, graciously agreed to be here today. So what is kidney failure? Kidney failure is the loss of kidney function that decreases the elimination of toxic waste from the kidney um, and from the body. And the treatment is with dialysis or kidney transplant. And other names for kidney failure include end-stage renal disease or ESRD or stage five chronic kidney disease. Um, so a little bit of history of kidney failure, and many of you may not have known this, but kidney disease has a big history here in Washington, and especially at the University of Washington. Now in 1953, Dr. Scribner actually came to the University of Washington. He went to Stanford, and he was actually known to be the father of dialysis and the father of nephrology. So in 1960, he developed the Scribner shunt, which was the first um, piece of equipment that actually allowed us to do dialysis in a repetitive fashion. Before, we could only do dialysis like once um, because the veins and the arteries wouldn't tolerate it. So he developed the Scribner shunt, and this is what that shunt looked like. And basically, the glass tube, one tube would go into the artery, and one tube would go into the vein. There it is. And so, and this apparatus would actually sit outside of the body on the arm. Um, and then in 1961, Dr. Scribner was given a kill dialyzer, and this was from Dr. Klaus Braun, who's from uh, Scandinavia, and, that, and then the UW dialysis program was born. So this is a picture of a kill dialyzer, um, and this is a patient, she, was di she dialyzed in her basement. Um, and this, this basically is her, her blood sort of going in and going out of this big dialyzer, uh, which was initially uh, made to actually oxygenate blood. So then in 1962, because the resources were limited, the Life and Death Committee was established to decide who gets to go on dialysis. Now this committee decided which patients would be accepted into the program at the University of Washington because of the limited funds and the limited space. And this committee actually ex consisted of two physicians who were not nephrologists, a housewife, a businessman, a lawyer, a labor leader, and a minister. And there was a famous article that was written in Life, and, and some of you may remember this, but this was the committee from 1962, and they decided who lived and who died. And in 1972, that's when the End Stage Renal Disease Act was actually uh, put into law. So these committees were no longer necessary. And a little bit more history is that cyclosporin, which is one of the medications we use for transplantation, was discovered and purified for human use. Um, and then in 1960, the first human transplant was conducted between twins. 
And also, um, there's another form of dialysis called peritoneal dialysis. Um, and that program was initiated in 1962 and 1963 when Dr. Bowen, um, who is a Dutch nephrologist, came to the Uni University of Washington, and Dr. Tinkoff, um, who initiated the peritoneal dialysis program. And Dr. Tinkoff actually perfected the peritoneal dialysis catheter. The kidneys filter and cleanse the blood. They help to maintain salt and water balance and they actually maintain the body chemical balance and produce hormones that help with anemia and bone disease and help to regulate blood pressure. And this is a kidney. Um, you have two. They sit in your back. Um, and then the signs of kidney failure are that people begin to feel tired or cold because of the anemia. They may have some nausea or vomiting, um, swelling. They can have increased or decreased urine output depending on where they're at in terms of their kidney function, shortness of breath, high blood pressure, and loss of appetite. So let's talk about what dialysis is. Um, and then, then we'll actually ask our patient panel to sort of tell us how they felt when they went on dialysis. So dialysis is actually the removal of toxins from the body and it uses a semi-permeable membrane. And this is the process that helps to maintain fluid balance and electrolyte balance and acid-base balance when the kidneys can't do it any longer. So hemo is Latin for blood, and that's why we call it hemodialysis. Um, and the blood is removed from the body, and it's put through a pump, and, the, and then put through a filter, which does the process that the kidneys did. And this filter is called the dialyzer. Um, and in order to do the dialysis, you have to have what's called a fistula, which is an access that allows dialysis um, through the arterial and through a venous needle. And here's a cartoon that sort of tells you what a fistula is. And basically, um, the surgeons will perform an operation where they connect the artery and the vein, and that will actually mature so that we can put needles into the artery and vein, and that's how we actually do dialysis. So there are three types of hemodialysis, and um, initially dialysis was done once a, once a week um, because that's all we thought that needed to be done. And then as we learned more about dialysis, we did it more often, so we did it three times a week. Um, and so now dialysis, we do three times a week for at least four hours each session. Um, but more recently, we've been doing a new form of dialysis called more frequent hemodialysis. Um, and that's divided into short daily dialysis, which is two to three hours or five to seven days per week, or nocturnal dialysis, which is eight hours, um, four to seven days per week, and patients will dialyze when they're actually sleeping. So more frequent dialysis, um, this is something uh, that's very new. It's called um, short daily dialysis, and there's this new machine that's called the Next Stage System. And it's a portable machine that patients can actually take with them and take on trips. Um, and they can do dialysis pretty much anywhere, and they're not regulated to coming into a center any longer. So it, it's thought to improve survival. There's better control of the fluid and diet and a better quality of life um, because patients can dialyze more often. And there's also nocturnal home hemodialysis where patients can dialyze at night while they're sleeping. And there's several machines to choose from, like a, there's a b brawn and a Fresenius machine and a next stage machine. Um, but this requires someone at home um, and it also improves the diet and fluid intake um, and also improves survival and the quality of life. <coughs> so why is more frequent dialysis better? So if you think about it, the kidneys will dialyze blood. They dialyze blood 24 hours a day or they filter blood 24 hours a day, seven days per week. And now if, if somebody does conventional dialysis, which is only three times a week, that's only 12 hours a week. So if you compare 168 hours per week, which is what the native kidneys do, to 12 hours per week, you can see that that's um, what we're doing in terms of dialysis is just a very short amount of uh, filtering of the blood. Short daily dialysis dialyzes about 18 hours per week. And nocturnal dialysis, if you do it five days a week, is about 40 hours a week, or a quarter of what the kidneys do. So even though we're doing dialysis and we're doing it for a long period of time, it, it pales in comparison to what the native kidneys do for us. Um, so patients do dialyze at home, and this is one of our patients who's dialyzing at home in his basement. Um, 
So I'm going to move on to peritoneal dialysis. This is a different form of dialysis where um, patients actually can use the, their peritoneal membrane, and I'll show you a cartoon of that, to do the dialysis instead of doing the hemodialysis. So in peritoneal dialysis, the toxins get removed from the body using the peritoneal membrane. And so um, your intestines are surrounded by this membrane. And if we put fluid around the membrane, then that membrane actually acts as a, as a filtering unit and you can do dialysis. And there are two types of dialysis. One's called continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis, or you can use a machine to help with that, and it's called automated peritoneal dialysis. So this is, again, another cartoon, and this basically shows the peritoneum. And these are, this represents your intestines, and a catheter goes into the abdomen, um, and then fluid surrounds the intestines, and that's how dialysis is performed. And these are the different catheters that can be used. This is a, a, a Tankoff catheter that was actually developed by Dr. Tankoff while he was here at the University of Washington. Um, and these are some of the supplies. And so patients can take these supplies and they can dialyze. Um, they can dialyze at home. They can dialyze in the office. They can dialyze um, in their cars. And um, that's how they perform dialysis. They can do that four times a day or they can do it at night. And they'll come into the dialysis unit for a monthly meeting. And this is one of our patients who's dialyzing in his car. So dial peritoneal dialysis is uh, very user friendly, very easy to do for most patients. And they, they can actually take it and travel with it. So um, if, those, if dialysis is actually OK, transplantation is probably the gold standard by which we measure um, kidney, renal replacement therapy, and it's the preferred method of kidney replacement therapy. And tr transplantation is basically you're taking a kidney that is surgically removed from another person and inserted into the body. And this can be from a person that is a living-related person, a living-related donor transplant. You can have a living, unrelated donor transplant, that, that patient who is not, or a person who's not related to you, or you can have a cadaveric transplant from some uh, kidney from someone who's died. And the nephrologist helps in the workup and, and make sure that patients can actually receive a kidney. And workup can consist of making sure that you can go through an um, operation um, and making sure that the, you don't have heart disease or the person doesn't smoke, um, that person is compliant with dialysis and, or the diabetes is controlled. Um, and a living-related transplant can be done using laparoscopic kidney removal, where they actually use uh, uh, almost like a telescope to go into the abdomen and remove the kidney so that you don't have to do surgery. Um, so I'm going to actually stop at that point. And these are some websites that are very useful for dialysis information. And I'm going to ask our, our two patients to come up, and we're going to ask them some questions. So thank you very much. So I'm going to go ahead and have you each introduce yourselves, and then I'm going to ask you some questions so that, um, and then I'll open it up to the audience so that if there are questions from the audience, we can um, have you guys respond. So this is Mr. St Mr. Stan Day, and Mr. Day is a businessman, owns his own business, and this is uh, Colonel um, Jim Manning, and he's uh, retired. And um, so I'm going to go ahead and start with you, Mr. Day. So go ahead and give a little history about how you... How all this happened. Yeah, how you started dialysis. <laughs> um, my situation started as a result of polycystic kidneys, which is a hereditary disease, and uh, my mother uh, contracted it, or it came through my mother. And out of the five kids, uh, my sister, who is currently in UW, hospital right down the row here and myself were the two recipients of the uh, gene which you know and the research is done now we know what what the gene is which uh, is a lot of the uh, implications from that um, this is my 
27th year, and I have, um, in that year period on. of time, I've had two transplants, and um, probably uh, 20 related operations in that period of time. And um, what else can I do? Um, I am now currently uh, on uh, home dialysis on that machine that you just saw, the small one. It's actually about the size of a uh, television set, a little bit bigger. And it has given, um, although the time required is, uh, is complex, uh, it does give me some more uh, freedom in my lifestyle because I used to go four o'clock every, every other day to the kidney center and spend five hours there and then home, sleep, get up the next morning, go to work and so forth. So uh, I am looking forward to uh, moving uh, to nocturnal dialysis as I gain more skill in this uh, area and hopefully um, will improve the quality of dialysis. And what my experience has been, um, about every five years, we get a leap forward in research, um, in discoveries and so forth. And this machine is another step forward. So um, pretty exciting. Do you remember how you felt when you first found out you had kidney disease? Can you sort of relate to us how you actually found out you had kidney, kidney disease? Well, yes, I, I remember it very clearly because uh, one, um, this all happened to me in uh, June of 79 when I had to start dialysis. I did get a Scribner shunt and uh, uh, it was, Probably the best way I could say it was completely overwhelming because of the financial implications and what about my life? And I was just married. I was married about three or four years. And um, I thought, you know, this is going to be a huge change in the way I live. But during those days, we, my uh, wife at the time became my assistant and we went on home dialysis. And uh, within about three months, we hardly skipped a beat. Um, not to say that it was easy, because um, your life uh, is never really the same. Um, you know, what you had in a completely healthy body is gone, and you don't get it back, um, regardless of, you know. I mean, I, I spend a lot of time in dialysis centers, and I see new people coming in and they, uh, ha they essentially ignore the fact that their, their life has changed. And it, sometimes it takes three to six months before they realize that they have a new life to deal with. And that was the experience that I had. But once you get used to it and you understand and you advocate for yourself and you um, start thinking about what you're eating, like the salt issue, and uh, um, you get those things under control, you can do fine. You can do pretty good. So I'm, I'm going to come back to that, but uh, Colonel Manning, I'm going to have you tell us how you learned, you started, learned about kidney failure and how did you start dialysis? I have been a dialysis patient since March the 14th of 2004. Prior to that time, I had diabetes, type 2, and hypertension, which was identified by my doctor back probably 10, 12 years ago, uh, just before I got ready to retire. And uh, so when I transferred to a different medical plan, I came under the guidance of a very wonderful nephrologist whose name is Bonnie Collins. And Bonnie uh, said to me, she said, your kidneys are, 
growing weaker and weaker. And as a result of that, I want you to have a shunt put in your arm so that if you have to go on dialysis, it will be there and be prepared. Well, I wanted to know, what is this shunt? No one showed me one. So I was constantly under this huge cloud about, what is this shunt? How is it going to work? But I went in for the surgery, and they installed the shunt. It's made of Gore-Tex. And they connected it to the vein on one end, the artery on one end by my wrist, and the vein in near my elbow. And that sat in my arm from November of 2003 until March, no, November of 2002 to March of 2004. I was, I was okay. And so I continued my lifestyle as nothing was uh, happening to me. But I did, you know, I did watch salt. Uh, that was something that was very easy for me to uh, rid myself of as a habit. I did not smoke because I had quit smoking back in 1963. So all of those things were working in my favor. But in February of 2004, after some series of um, blood tests, she said, it's your time. And I did not want to go. I really did not want to go. And in fact, I, I was quite ill and was hospitalized uh, the week before I started dialysis. So much so that when I had to go to dialysis on that fateful Sunday morning at 5.30, uh, my friend uh, Jim Garrison had to uh, carry me in a wheelchair from my car into the dialysis center to get weighed up and get my temperature taken and then moved to the area where I would be dialyzed. It was a rude awakening because I had never had someone enter my arm with a large, large fistula needle, size 15 if you are familiar with needle sizes, size 15 <laughs> is huge. And to see someone go into your arm and go into it a second time, and you see your red blood flow out, and then all of a sudden, they hook you to the machine, and you start processing. And you sit there, and if you don't have anything to do, your mind plays games on you. <laughs> And so, in my thoughts, I was really, really, I was really, really frightened, to say the least. But the interesting thing is that in my family, my older brother was a diabetic, uh, insulin dependent. My sister was diabetic, insulin dependent. My baby brother was diabetic, insulin dependent. My mother was diabetic, insulin dependent. My grandfather on my father's side was diabetic back in the 30s, insulin dependent. And so for me to come up with diabetes in my mid-60s, I sort of got caught or visited me as the last of the Mohicans. And <laughs> as a result of that, I'm now a home patient. I had a machine which was truly my friend. And it was my daily dialysis. Uh, it was made by a company called Axis. It was known as a PhD. But Axis Corporation's financial matters uh, became complex and they went bankrupt. And the bankrupt notice, notification came to me the day that I turned 75, and the notice was that the machine would be removed by the 31st of January, which meant that I had to go back into the center 
for dialysis three times a week until I could go to Northwest Kidney Center for retraining, which I am currently in on the next stage, and I'm in my second week, and today is Tuesday, tomorrow is Wednesday, they will deliver my machine, my machine to my home and set it up. I will stay at the, uh, Northwest Kidney Center Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and I'm out of there. <laughs> They, they know me at this kidney center for being one who speaks my peace whenever I feel like it. <laughs> and I, I, I am cordial towards them because they've given me a chance to enjoy a, a lifestyle which, you know, is not what I had before, but I substitute teach in the uh, Clover Park School District. I'm uh, a member or the president of the uh, Ninth and 10th Horse Cavalry Association, which is known as the Buffalo Soldiers here in the Puget Sound area. Uh, I was, up until this past year, the secretary of my homeowners association. So I, I'm busy. <laughs> uh, I, I stay on the computer, and that's one thing that being at home with daily dialysis, I have access to my computer and I can visit with friends all over the world and keep them informed about what I'm doing and also keep them informed about our mutual friends. So with that, that's my lifestyle as a dialysis, home dialysis patient. Um, Colonel Manning, were you the only one in your family to go on dialysis or were there My others? sister, my, uh, uh, and uh, I guess that's the part that frightened me, my sister, who lived in Washington, D.C., uh, was on dialysis in her late, late years, and uh, she suffered more by amputation of limbs. She lost her legs, and then finally she just gave up and said no more. But uh, she was the only one of my, fa my family to be on dialysis, although my baby brother passed away uh, as a result of kidney failure in his, along with other complications. My older brother passed away of a cardiac arrest as a, uh, during a trip, he was on a train heading off to uh, go on a cruise. But uh, my family members who saw him when he left home said when he left home he couldn't wear his shoes because he, he was suffering from edema. Mm -hmm. And his ankles were swollen. His, he couldn't put his shoes on. So you know, those are some of the things that I knew about. And believe you me, as I grew more close to that day of dialysis, I was very, very cautious about anything that I did with regards to my health. And I, my doctor will tell you that I've been a very good patient. <laughs> <laughs> um. Mr. Day, you yeah. have had um, transplant, two, two transplants. Um, can you give us a little bit of a picture of how it was like to go from being on dialysis to receiving a transplant and, and then going back on dialysis again? Um, yeah. Uh, uh, my first transplant came in uh, 1983. Um, I finally did arrive at the decision uh, to go ahead and accept the transplant as a good thing. And just as soon as I made that decision, the telephone rang and it was Dr. Quadrace and he said, I have to know now because if you don't want it, it's gonna go to whoever's in second place. So you don't have a lot of time with a transplant. And so I said, I'll take it and I made arrangements and got to the hospital. And uh, in those early days of transplantation, it was quite a bit different than now because uh, the transplant did go exceedingly well. Um, I woke up uh, you know, after a few hours and I could feel instantaneously. It's just unbelievable um, when you don't feel that energy uh, and then you get a transplant and all of a sudden you wake up and you feel like you want to just 
jump out of bed and go running down the hallway and the nurse is saying, don't do it, you know, you'll be sorry. <laughs> because your legs, you know, and the rest of your body is not ready, but you get that enormous feeling of energy. And in those days, this was 1983, all of my friends and family who came to visit me had to gown up completely, you know, white gowns and masks and the whole thing. I couldn't tell who some of the people were <laughs> unless I asked them, you know. And now since then, we've, they've learned a lot about transplants. And uh, that particular transplant was a cadaveric uh, transplant. Um, there's been a lot of uh, research and improvement in the immune suppression. For those of you who don't know it, you, when you get transplanted, your life changes again because now you have a huge amount of immune suppression because if you don't have it, your body will attack the transplant. So your immune system is suppressed. And of course, you can begin to imagine what the implications of that are. Uh, you know, people with colds, you have to avoid, uh, you know, depends on the dogs and the cats and all that stuff. You have to be way more careful about where you are and catching colds and staying healthy and stuff like that. So there's a whole, uh, whole other way of uh, living around that issue. The other thing is that most people don't realize that the medication for that little project runs anywhere from 600 to $1,200 a month. And depending on, you know, what the mixture is that you need. So like I said, my sister's down the hall right now as a transplant and she has some of the latest medication, way different than what I had. So the first transplant lasted uh, eight years. Um, and once I got used to the transplant, um, you know, and the freedom of moving around and making sure I took my medication and everything, it felt like getting back to normal life. Although I knew that it wasn't, you know, because I had to be so careful. Um, eight years later, um, exactly why it happened, I don't know, but I got into a rejection episode and... Um, and rejection is when you lose your kidney. Yeah. Um, and the, the, uh, there's a huge effort to try to save the kidney with uh, um, steroid approaches and that didn't work so eventually I lost that transplant and I went back on the list and, and about uh, a year later which is extremely unusual it doesn't happen anymore because not enough people are donating but um, in a year later I got a second cadaveric transplant and I even know where that one came from uh, it was actually a sort of humorous because I got the call that, that I had a perfect match. I showed up at the hospital and those of you who've been in this hospital can imagine about three o'clock in the morning and you got a hallway that's about two city blocks long and there's just one light at the other end of it. And we're going down that hallway and it's like you're going towards the light. You know? <laughs> and, and uh, I looked down between my legs, there was a box that said human organ, which was the transplant, going down the gurney with me to the uh, operating room. And so that transplant uh, lasted about five years and um, various explanations about why it didn't continue, but uh, it was very similar. I got uh, feeling like I, was run down and cold, and, but this time I recognized it right away and called the doc and I said, I think, I think I'm having a rejection episode. And once again, we attempted to uh, save it, but uh, couldn't it just gradually over about a three month period, uh, we lost that transplant. And so I am, uh, I'm back on dialysis now and uh, 
I actually, uh, because of these huge steroid injections, um, I lost both my hip joints. And in that period, um, after I had artificial hips, um, one of the, the right hand uh, prosthesis got an infection on it somehow. So it was a sort of an emergency trip to the hospital and pull that metal out of my body. And then we spent, so I spent about a year without a hip joint and um, tried very hard to figure out what the infection was and where it came from. And about a year later, after searching very hard for the right doctor, I did uh, find it dot and uh, he helped me get a uh, hip joint back in there but part of the reason that I do not go for another transplant which I could but um, we never figured out what that infection was and we're you know the doctors and I both say well what's going to happen if you get a transplant and we put you on immune suppression and we don't know what that bug is and where it's coming from or anything like that. So I've made the decision not to do a transplant. And I do live uh, pretty good. I work, I still work, and uh, um, you know, you can do well. This is, like I said, this is my 27th year, so um, you can do well. And I, one more thing I wanted to point out, just to give you an idea, that my mother, uh, died at about 36 or 37 after having five kids with polycystic kidneys. And at that time, they didn't understand at all about high blood pressure and kidney disease and stuff like that. So she lived for 36 years. I was about 33 when I finally had to go on um, kidney dialysis. And my sister, who we found out had the polycystic kidney at about the same time, and they, uh, she's a group health person, and they, they have managed her very, very well. And she was 53 before she had to. Mm -hmm. So she, you know, through medication and just really understanding how the kidneys function and how to manage them, um, she avoided it for quite some time. So there's lots of advances. In the interest of time, I am actually going to open uh, the discussion up to the audience um, and ask the audience if they have questions for Colonel Manning and for Mr. Day. Um, what's the difference between a shunt and a fistula, and what does it mean when the fistula is mature? Uh. <laughs> A shunt is, as I said, the unit that they placed in my forearm made of Gore-Tex. Uh, it's, it's not a natural material. The fistula is made up of the joining of your natural vein to your natural artery. And the maturation comes as a result of that tremendous pressure that the artery is placing upon the vein and it balloons it so that it becomes a very large vessel in your arm. And uh, it's very, very easy to then self-cannulate or self-stick both the arterial and the venous needle so that you can do dialysis. And what Scribner actually made that the, in the very beginning was called a Scribner shunt because it was artificial, but the fistula is from the native artery and vein, basically, where they're, they're sewn together, and then the hole is created between them, and that's what forms the, the fistula for dialysis, and the needles get placed into the venous part of that. I, I did have a Scribner shunt when I first started out, and it had tubes coming out of the arm in, in the little connection that you put together. The plastic was actually coming through your skin as you saw that diagram hooked to the plate that was on the outside of your arm. And it worked, but it was constantly 
uh, leaking and getting infected and stuff like that. So it was a whole process in keeping that from getting infected now. Um, I have a fistula, probably the one of the largest ones that you uh, can see, but it's 27 years old, and you know I've taken very good care of it, and um, it's been stuck with number 15 needles uh, three times a week for all those years. Well, except when I was on transplant, so 15 years. And the body heals up quite well. So if you, you know, just use good antiseptic and you can go on for a long time. I stick my fistula six times a week. So I dialyze every day except Sunday or Saturday, depending upon what I have to do. <laughs> so I, I, I say that and my, my point is to let you know I'm in control of my life because I am a home dialysis patient. And I'm not one who has to go to a center three times a week on their schedule. And we didn't talk about that much, but, but both of you are at home, dialyzing mm -hmm. at home mm -hmm. um, when you want to, but basically dialyzing mm -hmm. five to six times per week. Mm -hmm. Another question? Yes. and. Um, So I'm going to repeat the question, and the question is for Mr. Day, and why did your sister, what did she do to postpone renal failure to her 50s? Well, one, one of the biggest things was our discovering the doctor who looked at me said, this polycystic kidneys, who else in your family has it? Because they knew, you know, it was hereditary. So all my brothers and sisters came in and got checked, and she was the one that had it. So from right then, they began planning, you know, uh, and educating. The big issue back in the early days was salt, and uh, cut the salt way back. And um, she was, uh, first off, she loves to cook, and her husband cooks, and they, they controlled, uh, very uh, stringently controlled her diet. And, uh, you know, then there was uh, the nephrologist who helped them with the rest of it. It's how they did it, basically. Are there any, any additional questions? And we have Dr. Ryan and Dr. Fleet here as well. Right, we talk about uh, the hemodialysis and perineal dialysis. Is there an option, that one chosen over the other by a patient or the doctor or the condition of the patient? Can, who can properly answer that? So I'll start off and then I'll let you guys sort of uh, jump in. Um, we try to educate people so that they have a choice. And, and, and many people start dialysis and they think that they have to go in center and do dialysis three times a week. But what we're, what we're trying to do now in nephrology is educate everyone who has chronic kidney disease when they have earlier stages of chronic kidney disease so that they know that they can do peritoneal dialysis or home hemodialysis or daily dialysis or go in center, whatever is best for them. Um, and you know, one type of dialysis might not be what's right for everyone. Um, a lot of people will say that they'll start off with peritoneal dialysis um, because it's easy to do and people can, can do it at home and it's, um, you basically have to have a catheter placed into your abdomen, but not everybody can have that because if you've had prior surgeries before, you may not be able to do peritoneal dialysis. So the next be best thing, I think, because I direct the home hemodialysis program, and it's my bias, but I think doing dialysis at home, there's actually, it's been shown that home dialysis, whether it's peritoneal dialysis or hemodialysis, actually um, affords better survival, better quality of life. So the, the way that I think folks should go is maybe they should start with peritoneal dialysis if they can, then go to home hemodialysis if that fits with their lifestyle, and then go in center. But always the gold standard is to get a transplant. Yeah, uh, my question is, what's the research in artificial kidney or um, growing kidney tissue in laboratory condition to help you know, patients? Um, what, how, what's the time frame we're looking at to be something that's clinical um, useful? 
Um, so if I understood your question, what, what research is going on now in sort of kidney disease and dialysis? And, yeah. um, so, you know, kidney, kidney disease and dialysis, there, there hasn't been a lot of research done on that probably for the last 40 years um, because we're still sort of using the same basic technology that was developed back in the 60s. So this new machine that is doing daily dialysis is probably the newest technology that's come around probably within the last 20, 30 years. There's a lot of research that's going on in terms of looking at different ways to do transplantation and xenotransplantation, but I think that that's still a long ways off. Um, so now, and we're, we're sort of stuck with trying to dialyze as best as we, we can. I, I would think that one of the areas of research in dialysis right now is the miniaturization of dialysis equipment. Uh, the next stage, uh, system one, is a unit that sits right on a table like the table that's holding this projector. And it it's only weighs about 70 pounds when uh, it's in use versus the large 350 pound dialysis system that was just removed from my home. There is some nanotechnology. Miniaturization is the big yeah. thing right now. <clears throat> There's uh, stuff that's been on the table for a long time about growing a new kidney also, taking stem cells and then creating a, a matrix and then altering the uh, <clears throat> environmental and nutrient ingredients so that you would grow a kidney on this sort of template from your own stem cells. So all of that's ongoing and has been around the corner for a long time, but we're still hopeful.